Attention all cinephiles and spectral spectators, the film board gathers. I'm your ghostly host, Pete Wright, and I'll be your guide through the gooey world of Beetlejuice. Tonight, we've summoned two of the most frightfully entertaining co-hosts from the great beyond. First, the man who can elicit a chuckle from a corpse, Tommy Metz the Third. Hello, Tommy. <laughs> Hello, sir. <laughs> and second, the critic whose reviews are so sharp they can slice through the unsubtle specter of pedophilia, Steve Sarmento. <laughs> <laughs> Together we'll ask the big questions. Is Catherine O'Hara a comedic genius and why is that answer yes? And do we have proof that Keaton has taken off the makeup since the first film? Experts disagree. <laughs> so grab your popcorn, dim the lights, and remember, saying Beetlejuice three times won't make him appear. But it might just green light the next sequel. It's showtime. When you're all driving carpool and banging your Pilates instructors to fill the empty voids in your life, we'll see who gets the last laugh. My mom grew up here, that old house on the hill. Wait, the ghost house? Is your mom Lydia Dietz? Unfortunately. She's a legend. The living, the dead, can they coexist? Now's my chance. Ghosts aren't real. Only gullible people believe that kind of crap. I can't believe I'm doing this. Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice. <laughs> I need you to help me save my daughter. But how do I know that you're gonna keep your word? I swear on my dead mother's soul. Days. Bob, you and the boys stand guard. Nobody gets through. Oh. Let's go, honey. <laughs> Hello, boys. <laughs> uh, how how's your Beetlejuice day? <laughs> oh, oh, oh. Yeah, it's a day. <laughs> That didn't I, that didn't sound overly enthusiastic, Steve. No, no I, I I made a mistake. I watched <laughs> the original one two days ago. So Oh, oh yeah. okay. okay. So it's let us, so let I should us start off there. The yes, I, I want to the start first. there. So mm -hmm. let's just go. What are your what are your are your general feelings about the first movie? Like, do you have a strong affinity for it? You just watched it. How how does it sit in your sort of emotional movie shelf? I, had, I I had not watched it in in quite a while. I remember I was in high school when it first came out. Saw it in the theater with friends. It was packed and really enjoyed. I've seen it several times since then, but decided it was time to revisit it. Uh, hadn't really seen it in quite a long time, and was surprised at how fun and fresh that movie is to this day. That I. I still laughed out loud. I had so much fun with it. I had forgotten that it it is such a simple story, but it's that that quirkiness that just everything is just shifted slightly off. That it's just I don't know. There's something just that I quirky is the only word that I can say is it doesn't take itself too seriously. It's exaggerating things. It's cartoonish, but it holds itself together somehow. The ending is there's there's not any sensible resolution to things, but it just works so well together i ended up rating it four and a half stars i didn't think it was going to be that high i love that movie so much all right four and a half stars tom hi i um love the original i haven't watched it recently but only because i've watched it so many times i feel like it's like it's become like the breakfast club for me like i feel like i can probably quote most of the movie uh i love any looks into the afterlife and to have a comedic one and to have one based in such bureaucracy and it looking like making the death be like the dmv was such a cool fresh interesting take i absolutely loved it i also uh, am a fan of it and recently it has been reborn in my life because everybody in the family discovered beetlejuice the musical and it's fantastic like it is just a fantastic take on this whole thing and it's a technical marvel seeing it live it's an unbelievable array of lights and projection and all of that and you're right like the the 
the unique take on Afterlife is what makes that film really, really special. And so that brings us to a generation later. Here we are with Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice, and we're our our focus. It, it, this is a the film focuses on on a post family tragedy. We'll talk about the family tragedy shortly. Uh, so three generations of the Dietz family uh, return home, as IMDb puts it, to Winter River, still haunted by Beetlejuice. Lydia's life is turned upside down when her teenage daughter Astrid accidentally opens the portal to the afterlife. Um, Astrid, we bring in uh, uh, Jenna Ortega, who is on a uh, a delightfully high run off of Wednesday, uh, playing this sort of uh, the, the Winona writer of today right now. She does not play uh, a, 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 you know, a brooding uh, goth teen in this movie. Uh, that's still portrayed by Winona Ryder. <laughs> She's now a brooding goth adult. Uh, so let, let's talk about uh, about your initial takes on the film. Um, uh, Tom, you want to start? Sure. First, I have to start with caveats. Yeah. Ew, what was wrong with my voice? Caveats. <laughs> um, I on the day that I saw this movie, I had to get up extremely early for a blood test uh, before a uh, routine physical, and I had to go down to Beverly Hills because that's where I get it because I only get my blood taken by fancy people, and I had to be there at seven thirty, which isn't that crazy, but it's a forty-five minute drive, and I had to take care of Foster, so I was already extremely tired. And in the theater I saw this at, the air conditioning was not working very well, and it's been 108 degrees, not joking, in the valley where I saw it. So all of That's, that. You're practically I in the afterlife right, right now. Right. I was <laughs> I um, uh, was not in the greatest mood for this. That being said, I really wanted to like it, and I still really want to like it. <laughs> Unfortunately, I did not. I disliked it a lot more than I did like it. Uh, I feel this movie is so strangely, it's somehow understuffed and overstuffed. It is anemic while being bloated. <laughs> and the fact that I am such a fan of the first one, which maybe it's not a simple tale, but it, compared to this, it is so nimble and so streamlined that this one just felt like at one point there was this movie was somehow twice as long and then they had to cut all these pieces. I don't know. I was very, very frustrated. That being said, William or er, William Defoe. Oh yeah, William Defoe is in it. But no, <laughs> what I wanted to say is Michael Keaton has not skipped a step. He is really a lot of fun. And there's some great moments to it, but overall I thought it was just a bloated mess, which is very disappointing. And I find no joy in saying that. Yes. I, I felt like it was if you recall our conversation about Alien Romulus. It was like there was too much and therefore not enough of anything. It was things were underdeveloped. It was it was that there were I sitting here watching this and as we're we're getting through the story and it's okay, this storyline and then this storyline, this storyline, and I'm thinking, when is this going to start taking off? When are things going to start moving? Because I'm just getting set up and set up and set up and nothing's happening and just the energy was just draining out of me of like, I wanted to, I wanted to love this so much. I thought, okay, we're going to, we're going to start strong. We're going to, and just, ugh. and then it just flopped and just laid there. And yeah, it didn't commit to anything in any conceivable way that I could see. But as my wife and I were discussing this, she said it, it felt like a patchwork quilt of like fanfic that just got fragments just assembled together of, Oh, here's some different ideas but none of them are developed enough. So we'll just basically compensate by putting multiple ones in there um, rather than actually developing something, you know, coherently. And so it was truly a, a disappointment. She has, I am apologizing to her for taking her to see this because when the trailer first came out, she said, Oh, I don't know. And I said, no, come on. Michael Keaton signed on it. It can't be. Oh yeah. She's I owe her for, for dragging her to a, <laughs> 10 45 a.m show this morning to this yes that's that's pretty much where i landed and and i think it starts with beetlejuice himself and i i agree with you tom that that i i think michael keaton is i mean he's a singular talent like he has a, a fantastic charisma on screen you know whatever movie we're talking about like i just really like michael keaton i do think in the first film we have a young guy 30 years younger and he's in a suit, but he's kind of dressed 
slovenly, right? He's dressed like a guy who should, but he still has the energy of a guy who's 30 years younger. He's also the antagonist, right? He's like, he's a bad guy in the first movie, right? He's trying to manipulate people to free himself and gain ultimate power. And I think this movie, he's a 30-year-older guy still in a fat suit, but really reeking of 30-year-older energy. Like, I mm. just I, I just never quite got into the the Beetlejuice as the the heroic accomplice, like the thing you would you you negotiate with to an end. Mm -hmm. And and so I I struggled with feeling like he was a bad guy. And you know, where the first movie has this really frenetic dance between dealing with Beetlejuice, who is constantly in hyperactive overdrive, and dealing with Otho and the manipulation of the house, right, on, yeah. on this very tight emotional story, those two sort of, um, uh, uh, you know, fights that that she's going through are really legitimate, Lydia. Like, she's she is legitimately yeah. trying to overcome some things in those two, those two dances. And this movie introduces, I think, more dances and makes Beetlejuice, I, I think, less compelling by removing some of his antagonism hmm. and yeah. I, I, am i alone in that what's your like if we're focusing on beetlejuice the portrayal of this character and his utility in in the movie mm -hmm. I, I i i just felt let down i, I agree a hundred percent there was I don't know what it was if it was trying to give us too much information so i start asking question about why but since each storyline is not developed enough so with beetlejuice we start off with him basically what like working you know managing the customer service call center or something like that so i funny setup yeah, funny I, premise yeah but i mean he in the first one he's 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 gone rogue he's a rebel off on his own yeah. and here he's sort of like for whatever reason he's bought into the system and is is pining for um you know his you know love um but i don't really have much more i it, it's not consistent with what i expect that character to be i mean because to me the marriage wasn't so much in the first one wasn't so much about love it was a a whole like loophole to get what he wants he's a selfish a guy he's yeah. always going to play people to get the angle of what he wants and i didn't get that side of him as much sure he i mean michael keaton's doing d doing right by this character and it was con i think consistent it was just the story that that character was given i just did not see how that that fit in um because i didn't know where it was going with that i i could identify his motivation in the first one his things were simple this is the, there's too many compounding factors in each of these storylines that i i struggled to identify like where's where's this going am i rooting for him or not or wh wh what are the stakes at play for beetlejuice in this one right tom you write movies why did i not find the thread <laughs> which thread <laughs> exactly. there's too many there's just too many threads and it leaves everything really um anemic like you have monica bellucci she has an amazing setup the longest stapling scene in, in movie mm -hmm. history unfortunately it's like there is continuity editing uh but then she has nothing to do but stalk through halls and do the same trick over and over again why would we find that one effect cool the fourth time i know that bob gets a chance to sort of make a noise but i don't know well, I she didn't... eats a sticker <laughs> that's yeah gross. like <laughs> right. she stuck right. to the hi my name is bob sticker down right. her throat that right. was weird that, what a weird choice she just has and then she's gone in a heartbeat Two, yeah. two interesting, potentially interesting characters are so short thrift that they are gone in a set piece when they're not even the focus of the set piece. Justin Thoreau, for instance, I feel like he is a character. I love Justin Thoreau, and he's a delight in this movie while being really scattered. He's four different people. And yes. what you know, he's a jerk. But what makes him a jerk? Is he because he's such an overly emotional person or he's greedy or he's a weird? I mean, it's just. There seems to be this feels like a movie that was written by eight people and they weren't allowed to read each other's scripts at times. Yeah. And then they had to shove it all together because this is too many movies. in this. And with that involved, none of the movies are played out fully. And it just it made me just so 
it made me bored. And being bored at times in a Beetlejuice film is insane. Yeah, it's it's really strange because there is I, I mean, there is a lot going on. I think one of the most interesting <laughs> action sequences is when Jenna Ortega hits a tree with her face. Um, <laughs> like I, I found myself actually really interested in their approach to Jenna Ortega because she is arguably the, the bigger star next to Keaton. And yet she is second fiddle in this movie. Winona mm-hmm. Ryder is is this is still her story. Mm -hmm. Uh, it, it's sort of the, the generational sort of Dietz women story revolves around her. And, uh, I, I I felt like that she wasn't, she, she didn't have the charisma on screen for me to really be interested. It, I was most interested when Jenna Ortega was talking to dead nineties boy, uh, (laughs) or when Monica Bellucci was wandering around sucking faces, mostly from the perspective of, I wonder when this is going to really take over the film. Right. Yes. Right. And they mm-hmm. refused to have any of them take over. Yeah. And then yeah. they just had to get rid of. Speaking of, you were saying you were having trouble with the Winona Ryder charisma. Yes. Yeah. My apologies. I think Winona Ryder can be seen as a treasure, but I'm not convinced that she is much of an actress <laughs> anymore. She seems to have through throughout this movie, she has two modes and that's it. And then I remember that seems to be what she has in Stranger Things, too. Yeah. Just crazy. What's going on? Or okay, I'm okay now, and that's it. But there's yeah. so many other characters and stories in Stranger Things over the course of a 12 episode yeah. season. And you're fine. That I'm yeah. fine. I'm right, really right. fine because yeah. I totally agree. Yeah. Uh, so I, I I think that really gets to the to the heart of it. I'm most interested. I personally I was most interested in Dead Boy Society. Um, it, it, did you guys have a preference of of which which story you wanted to watch? Out of the four stories, yeah, I like that. You can yeah. see it coming. They, I mean, the the from the first second they don't show the parents' faces. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you're waiting. Yeah. That, you're waiting for that yeah. reveal. But right. That's fine. Yep. Uh, but yeah, yeah, I was more interested in that because then she is sort of being Beetlejuiced by a different Beetlejuice. Yes. But then the problem is. I might be more interested in seeing that as a movie and not in a Beetlejuice movie because the whole time I'm like, got cut back to Beetlejuice. He's the yeah. only thing yeah. keeping me awake here. Like, let's, yes. let's bring it back to him and stop Absolutely. introducing all of these other people. There's just a lot of people for no reason. Yeah. I wanted so much more of Monica Bellucci because I thought that's such a, just a solid introduction to a character. And then it was at one point where I thought, I'm thinking, we haven't seen her for like 40 minutes. Is this, is her storyline <laughs> gone? What is going on? I wanted more. I, Always. I, we, we love seeing what's going on in the land of the dead in the first movie. Cause it just, the, the production design is so compelling. So when we were in there, I thought, yes, I want more of this. Whenever we were out in the real world, I'm like, I don't need this. I don't need to be at, at school. I don't need to be at an art gallery. I don't need to be in these places. All this, the first movie takes place in the house. That's it. And then the, you know, the land of the dead here, mm-hmm. we're, we're all over the place, introducing character stories, all of that. Yeah. Astrid and her 90s dead boyfriend. Yeah, that's that feels like that was a movie that could have been developed and they just packaged into this. That could be solid standalone material. It has no connection to Beetlejuice. You could you could develop that on its own. It is a compelling story. I, I thought that was going well, but it needed more. So I thought the idea of oh, Beetlejuice was previously married. We get more into his character. I thought, okay, that was interesting to me because if we're if she's going to be the big bad in this one, then it might make sense why Lydia has to get the aid of Beetlejuice again because sure. Dolores has some big nefarious scheme, but her, her plan is to just walk around saying, I want Beetlejuice and suck the souls out of people for, for no, no reason that we're no given reason. at all. She's got no end game, no goal. I thought um, I was assuming like she's getting their memories or their abilities or something, but she's not. No, she's, she's just she's she's not. Right. And so again, I I I wanted more of that. I I'm still kind of torn about the flashback. You know, their origin story. There were there were a lot of stylistic changes in this. We've got that. We've got an animated sequence, and I it, it just again felt like all over. If it was just that one story, then I could I could see that. You know, I I could buy into that. I love that it was in. Is it Latin, Spanish? I, you know, yeah. the, we've got we've got subtitles, all it's that. Fine, I thought, okay, yeah, really something cool. clever, something something fun. I never asked for the origin story of Beetlejuice, but I thought, oh, okay, it's important to this relationship, at least to her motivation. But there was no payoff. 
for it. But those two stories, if you had picked either one of those and really gone into that as the main story for this film, I I would have been I would have enjoyed it more than what I've got. I don't know that I would have loved it, but it would have been yeah. more enjoyable. Well, I think the the opportunity lost in the movie, this is why I keep going back to Dead Boy Department, is because that's the part where even though I knew something was happening, mm -hmm. I felt like in hindsight, the little tricks that they did, the production design of his room, like mm -hmm. looking at all of the posters that were so close to me, right, in yes. the 90s, yeah. and yeah. look going through his albums, and that whole, that oh. whole vernacular, sort mm -hmm. of visual vernacular, was intrigue. That mm -hmm. was a mystery to be figured out. Like, why does all of this tie together? And that's the only time that that exists in this movie. The <laughs> only time I'm actually thinking and engaging with the mystery, the prov provo uh, the provocative mystery of this movie. And I I find that it's so frustrating, uh, you know, because there there was just nothing else to learn. There was nothing else to learn. I watched a, a really interesting, uh, right before this movie, I was, you know, I don't know, doom scrolling. And there was a Trey Parker and Matt Stone uh, the video that's floating around where they talk about screenwriting. And, and they say, um, you know, most scripts are beat to beat to beat by saying, here's a beat, then this happens, then this happens, then this happens. And what they say is, this happens, and therefore this happens. Mm -hmm. This movie is a this happens and this happens and this happens movie. There is no reason for them to fall out of the emergency exit into the desert other than seeing a <laughs> sandworm. That's the mm -hmm. only reason. <laughs> right, mm -hmm. right. Yeah. For a movie that is trying to introduce so many new things, it's also understandably obsessed with the first movie. Yes. But not yes. as much in an organic way like Pete just said. Yeah, it's just sort of yeah. like, well, what else haven't we shown yet? Yeah. yeah, right. It's it's as if the writers had seen the movie, but didn't really understand the first Beetlejuice. They they saw it and they said, oh, sandworms, this, this. And they they basically distilled it down to key elements, said, OK, let's play with these without understanding how all of those things work together or what made that film tick. What what is the strength of that film? And then to do something. I'm fine with moving into the real world if we're going to do that. But then you have to me, it's so much about the tone of how you handle things. And it just was inconsistent uh, across the film. If we're going to be doing, you know, quirky things with Beetlejuice, all that, then it, it's really tough for me to go from from that to something that's played so straight, you know, because even yeah. what even yeah. in the original, when we have scenes with the Maitlands and things like that, it, there's just uh, it's just off to the side. It's sort of just so uh, stereotypical cliche, like, oh, perfect little country family and everything's, you know, that early Tim Burton sort of taken 120%, right? We're going to just exaggerate. We're going to make it slightly cartoonish, slightly beyond reality. But here we it got gritty and in, in the real, even, even in, uh, at, at the end when, um, we're getting blood splatter and I'm like, there's no blood splatter in the original Beetlejuice that I'm aware of. There was a lot more grit and gore in this one that, I don't feel was necessary. It just didn't work as well for me because it just felt like it was taking me out of that world that I wanted to be in. Catherine O'Hara brought yep. every bit of the Catherine O'Hara I want reportedly, just like in the first movie, much improvised. Mm. Um, and mm. she is so brilliant at that kind of comedy that as the senior anchor of the Dietz family, I found her delightful. Like, I just like her so much. Mm -hmm. And I was worried when I saw that she was in this movie because I went in, as you know, not thrilled that we had picked the movie for the for this month. <laughs> and uh, and she was a redeeming quality when when she was on screen. I think she is yes. super funny. And, and Agreed. I, I, yeah, I think she played well. When you look at the 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 interplay of the the Dietz women, since so much of this movie is about the three of them and how they work together, what are your thoughts on the Dietz family legacy, generational legacy? I mean, it's hard to say a little bit, and I don't mean to dunk on her, but I mean, there's a bit of a cipher in the middle of it. Yeah. So it's hard to say, like, there's this through line, and isn't it interesting how they all uh, play off of each other and have their own? They're all in three different movies. And yeah. what's her name? Yep. Catherine Harris is, is an interesting one. Yeah. And Jenna Ortega is in a very competent and watchable one. And Winona Ryder is also in this movie. <laughs> it's present. Yeah. 
<laughs> no, it's it. They the thing with with Astrid is they introduced her, and this is again something that was there that I thought was going to be something is they introduced her as being very involved in some type of like climate change environmental club or something like that and when we're in the land of the dead we get somebody that comes in like all covered in oil and we've got oh it's, oh here's another one of the protesters and i thought oh are we making an eco statement in this movie is that is that her story there's going to be some connection that and then it's completely dropped with um with lydia and her tv show i thought that's an interesting place for this character to go knowing that she can see she can see dead people. It wasn't just the Maitlands. It's something that she's now leveraged into a career to make something of herself. But then that's that's dropped. Um, it's it's we get these little setups, and we we went from what was in the original Beetlejuice like a high concept comedy to some attempted a character thing with heights. They're trying to tie to that, and it, I just felt like everything was there for a setup, and then they dropped it and moved on to some, some other story they wanted to tell with, um, with Delia. Yeah. The idea that she went into her, you know, her, her big, you know, art show of herself as the, you know, canvas and all that. I thought, interesting idea, but why we don't, I found myself, my wife and I found ourselves asking lots and lots of questions because there was all this information given that in the first, we don't get any information. There's no reason why why Charles and Delia would be a married couple. They're such opposites, but we never ask ourselves, like, how did these two get end up matched? But now in this movie, we've got all these questions about everybody's life situation because we're given too much information about them. Instead of being yeah. flat caricatures, they're trying to make them rounded characters and not, and there's no logic to a lot of the things that happen. It's, as Tommy said, it's just like, this then this not this because of this has to happen it's just we're 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 putting we've already got a preset arranged set of dots and we've just got to connect the lines somewhere there's no cause and effect to anything because this is a generational story i i was kind of trying to watch what are we what are we trying to capture with the the fact that it's the the three deets women mm -hmm. who have survived right they're sure. here and they are um you know they're trying to find a way to thrive and rebuild relationships across generations and we have uh granddad right they're here there to celebrate the death of of celebrate the death of granddad uh, right. who right. is wandering around the afterlife ha half eaten by a shark yes. Yes. uh speaking out of his exposed um i don't know esophagus somehow yeah. Um, which I which I thought was unpleasant. That wasn't a fun. It, it wasn't fun. for me. It was just kind yeah. of gross. But yeah, yeah. It, it and I out, like, to I, all playing. I could do is I mean they also show his face in the movie nine hundred thousand times. They're really worried that we're going to forget who everyone is there, right? And all I can think of is the reason that he's not in the movie, which of course yes. you can I, anyone can go ahead and look up uh, Jeffrey Jones's. He's why he's you haven't seen him in Hollywood stuff. He had a, a, a different hobby. Um, but uh, and so it's just it just kept taking me out of the movie over and over and over again, especially the fact that they kept coming back to the gravesite, which has like mm -hmm. I, I was actually OK a little bit with the fact that that the the character is wandering around the afterlife half eaten. You know, we don't get his head. He's mm -hmm. a different kind of a different voice, but that they kept going back to the gravesite, which yeah. has mm -hmm. a perfect embossed like glass picture yeah. of mm -hmm. him. I was I, I just. I didn't care for it. I didn't care for it. I, I, I just felt like it was too much. Like, what are they trying to do homage, uh, uh, you know, homage to right now with mm -hmm. this, with the way they treated his character? So well, they're, we they're lost treating him. him like yeah. it was a beloved actor that died. Yeah, right. and that's in real life, right? Like they were, we were really spending time honoring him, and he is very alive. Yeah, and, and, and why did we need him. that whole animated sequence of what happened to him? I, again, it felt like we kept getting information. It's like all what I need to know is a character. That, that claymation of, of Charles, oh, how he the dies, plane the plane crash, crash and all really that. Because that. again, we're going to, we, we, because that was the first time when we get to that, I'm like, okay, we're going to do a flashback, but we're going to do it in animated because we can't use this actor. So we're going to sculpt something that is, you know, very closely resembles oh, him right. to remind us what he looks like, <laughs> which could have been two lines of dialogue, but they tried to play it like a joke. Oh, well, the plane crash. Oh, he died in the plane crash. No, he didn't die in the plane crash. It was this and that. And I thought, okay, it wasn't that funny, but it, it just was dragging on. And I felt mm -hmm. like that's not necessary unless his death was some critical point of the story, which I still struggled to find out why it needed to happen within the story. And it couldn't have been that he, he died 
you know, it became a MacGuffin to, to get the, the women together, but there could have been other events. I, you know, yeah. we could have had that in passing reference, his tombstone shaped like a shark fin is a, is a good joke, but it, we didn't need his face on it. It would have been great. Just a, a marble or granite marker in, in the town there. And why do they not live in that town that the house is in? Everybody has vacated that. that I'm, I'm asking questions that there are no answers that I shouldn't be asking, but it's, it's, it begs me to ask them because it gives well, me the, and, and the movie leans in on the, the sort of parallelism too, because I never thought, I, I guess I did at one point, I was like, okay, eventually they're going to have to show us uh, Astrid's dad. And I, I, had, I think I thought that because I so deeply hoped they wouldn't feel the need to. Yeah. Right. Um, that we felt a lot like, of time. That was a whole other uh, storyline. A yeah. whole different oh, storyline yes. with Santiago Cabrera, who is yeah. a fantastic actor. And to put like little robot piranhas all over him was, <laughs> you know, uh, it was cute. I was done. Um, that could have been just another waiting room character and and we'd been fine. And I liked I think I preferred the idea of the grief that uh, Astrid was going through to be felt and processed, not addressed by a character from the dead. Uh yeah. Like she, she, she was on the verge of actually healing and not, and, and coming to terms with the fact that, you know, there is loss in the world. Right. You and don't get that a it, final hug every time. Right. right. Exactly. Exactly. Um, so th- there is some interesting parallelism to that, that, that I don't think actually uh, filled out n- much for me. So uh, we do get uh, Justin Thoreau. He did not appear sleeveless at all in this movie, which is. Yeah. Uh, actually that's weird, not that's in his writer it's, weird. it's kind no. of in his writer is to rip the sleeves off at some point <laughs> i thought at the wedding that nighttime yeah. wedding shirts yes. off greased up <laughs> might have been a thorough thing uh but he didn't he i i do i think tom you said it earlier i do like him a lot mm-hmm. and the character was all over the place yeah uh and and i did feel a little bit um you know deus ex machina when they gave him the truth serum at the end to give us an exposition dump about right. what we already really knew that he was a manipulator uh, but but none of his character stuff matched that he, he was like a, a new age whatever the word is for new age like he was a overly evolved new aged speak your mind kind of thing that doesn't connect with um he wasn't doing it like his enablers yeah manipulator right I don't know. yeah 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 there was something shady about him and he just didn't it didn't add up uh, I, it's kind of a bummer because fun. I like him. He's yeah. really fun. Yeah, he is fun. Okay. The villains. We've mentioned them all, uh, at this point, the villains that we're most interested in dead boy, uh, right. played by Arthur, Arthur Conti. Uh, we had Monica Bellucci playing Dolores. Right. Okay. Uh, are we counting Rory? I think ultimately we have to count Rory as a villain. Yes. Who's Rory? Uh, Justin uh Justin oh, that's Thoreau. Justin Thoreau. I'm yeah. sorry. Yep. 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 Yeah. And do we get to count Beetlejuice? Yes. <laughs> I'm just, you, I'm don't just sound, you don't sound very committed to that. <laughs> I feel like we could push you on that. I in this story, I don't know. And then there's the character we haven't talked about, who I think because we haven't talked about this character reveals that that there is no function to this character. We talk about Willem Dafoe. It's Willem right. Dafoe. Like what oh, is and that what whole is thing? This, like what are we what doing? What is this function in this story? I mean, it's uh-uh. it, it's okay. There's things that are written as a setup for a gag, maybe, and and that's it. And I understand that it's like yes, there's fun things you get to do in the land of the dead there, and all of that. Um, and whether he's a police officer or an actor and all that, right. and it, it's it's fun, but it's not in service of anything having to do with any story. Why he and the other, you know dead police officers have to come storming in at the way i i don't know is he who is he out to capture beetlejuice is he out to capture dolores i don't understand what his role is of what 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 his what his goal is what what is he wanting to do that's right he Um, has a whole storyline too i forgot no but he doesn't have a storyline he's got scenes he's got scenes absent a a story i like i would rather see that move like whenever that woman would come in and hand him a cup of coffee coffee. i laugh every single time every time so that's fun but in an already overstuffed movie and there's not a clear part like right when it's supposed to be his big time to shine they literally just freeze them yes so they're not even in the scene anymore yeah it's just too many ideas yeah right but it, well, it does get into there's there's one part that's if you're really if you've watched Beetlejuice a lot and Tommy, I don't know if you've ever caught on to this. And I think 
in the first one, Otho mentions it. Um, if the people that actually work there that are like the civil servants, they've all died from suicide. Oh so, no, I a hundred percent. Yes. So oh, the Otho people mentions, behind the behind the desk, anybody that's working there have died from suicide, so which is my wife and I were talking suicide. Well, I don't know. That's, that's an interesting thing, but that gets to Astrid's dad because he's working immigration. Right? Did he, he didn't commit suicide? We don't know. But in the in the first one, the the woman that's you know taking number, she's like, oh yeah, I wouldn't have had my little accident if I'd known this was what it's like. And Juno, the caseworker, her her throat is slit. And Otho mentioned something about civil servants and suicide. I um, totally forgot about I that. And that, that is I not followed that. up correctly in this movie. Then it's, it's it, 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 it could it could be a dimension that's that's darker if we focus solely on Lydia, Astrid, and um. What's his name? Um, you know, Richard. Um, Richard. That dynamic, because it's like, okay, maybe that's why Lydia can't see him because he is a suicide, right? And it's like she's thinking her dad just left or whatever, but was there something going on? There's there's an interesting dynamic there between mom and daughter and dad that's gone. That I thought, okay, it felt like they hinted at it. I, again, I don't know if they're aware of that in the right. Beatles mythology, but no one commits suicide by piranha, <laughs> right? Yeah, I, yeah. Unless, it. unless he did. Uh, like I'm, unless I'm he says, you know, I'm ending it all. I'm going to throw myself in into, into the water, the piranha, right. or, or Willem Dafoe, and all the police officers. Technically, they're working there, so were they? Th- all that, suicides, right? I think yeah. that was just sort of cleverly forgotten. I I think that so. was just swept yeah. under the rug for this one. Yeah. But again, so what do all the police do? They're they're dressed in police uniforms, so then they're now police. But other people that are working there don't have their outfits don't match what their function oh, sure. is. There, you've got gonna, the if the idea is to take this sick thing, you know, working behind the, the information. Afterlife, well, that's definitely then, a road to to death, though. The yeah, right, sure, guy. sure. The, well, the other thing is, this is interesting. Danny DeVito's character that oh, yeah. actually plays oh. right into what you're talking about because we actually right. see him see drinking him. varnish yeah. at the end, right? As a yeah. that, what a weird casting for for that character. I didn't understand right that. Yeah. I, I guess DeVito got to work, but uh, yeah. Wait, we saw him drinking varnish when he was alive. No, when he was dead. Like, right. And when I felt like dead, that was but... a note to indicate, oh, he's he can't. Oh, that's how he died. He, that's how he yeah. died. I, I, oh, I, I didn't put that together. I thought he was just ghost being ghosts. Okay, fair enough. Yeah. <laughs> Good. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, so yeah, I don't think that explains Defoe, but I think you're absolutely yeah. right. I I low key love all of the, the like weird afterlife cop cliches that they yeah. dump out one after another, after another, the fact that he gets the coffee every time and is constantly squeezing the cup. Like those oh, things yeah. are so funny. And yes. that is like um, a separate, like cops on the case, a Beetlejuice story, right? You could, that's like a separate <laughs> damn movie that would be awesome. It's true. Or to to take original. Monica Bellucci yeah. completely out right. of it. And just yes. he's the one chasing Beetlejuice. Right, because yes. yeah. he's a flat, stereotypical character. That's what every character is in the first one. They take a type and they just ramp it up. And he is the, the cop. He's doing all the cliche things. Yeah. That's what defines him. That makes him the perfect fit for that. That's the movie he was, I don't know, he thought he was in because he was doing that very well, I thought. Yeah, they kept putting p- playing that, like, uh, you know, reminding us and reminding him that he's not a cop. He was a B-movie star. But in right. the yeah. afterlife, he's a cop. Like, that's his function. Allegedly. Or he thinks it is. Or he's just taking that on as his role. I, I don't yeah, know. Maybe. Yeah. Maybe. Uh, we also have uh, Bern Gorman as Father Damien, the Reverend. He's interesting. Mm. Yeah. Is, he is interesting. Why is he interesting? they i don't know he's interesting like a lot of the like otho was like yeah the, at one point the the movie the first movie was everyone like you guys have both said i'm saying nothing new but it's normal then heightened everyone's mm-hmm. heightened no one is a real person even dinner guests aren't real people and it's like they right. remembered that for the priest like who's this guy yes. that <laughs> talks and only seems to move one <laughs> tiny part of his face when yeah. he yes. talks, yeah, cast him in that. That's fun because why not? But it, it also almost becomes a little distracting when you have certain people like certain people are playing it very grounded. Mm-hmm. And so to sure. throw other people in there, which right. are just these weirdos. Yeah, I was yeah. waiting to find out what's his reveal because he's yeah. so interesting. There's got to be a reveal and the reveal was there's nothing to reveal. 
No, <laughs> there he's, was no rabbit in the hat. I don't think if I no, remember. He's from that town, which means you're yeah. a little, you know, he's just a little weird. He's a little weird. He speaks in like archaic, weird, churchy language or whatever. Yeah. You now he speaks. And it's like, that's great. That fits in with that town. That town is like quirk central. That's, you know, that's how it is. But you're right. That's it seems odd. And it stands out when you've got like an Astrid or, you know, 90s dead boy where it's like, oh, they're in our world. And we've got right. characters that live in this other world. And yeah. they're they're it, they're walking and talking together. It, it Something's wrong. Something's off. There should be like we got to pull back the curtain as to why this is allowed to happen. But yeah. Which, Never which I think is is what's funny. Like that is all of that stuff is what's funny. It's the fact that I don't know. I, I think what the what Beetlejuice as a cinematic universe gets right is that as soon as they take us into the DMV of the afterlife, mm-hmm. it it is so weird looking and yet feels so familiar. So much so that when you go into a post office or a DMV, you right. can kind of put yourself there. Yeah. And that's the joke. Oh, sure. I think the yeah. And and I I do I like that about these movies, and I think mm-hmm. the first movie executed it so much better. And this movie has is just the jokes, and it's not there's there. I just don't see. I, I just came out of it bored because they were they were trying to jam too much stuff in. Well, yeah, we that was the the bureaucracy, the the aspect of it's the waiting room, and you've got your case manager, and that's it. Once we get to yeah. Well, there's the soul train and other lands. And all of a sudden we've got a, oh. the universe is expanding. I'm like, no, 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 this is supposed to be like a little way station in between. Like there's this room, this hallway with whatever, six rooms or whatever. And that's it. I didn't need it to be larger. Everything about this film got larger when the strength was how small it was in the scope of the story and the settings was really tight and confined. And that worked so well. And we kept it kept expanding it out. And to me, that just caused more and more problems. Why there's dancers for the soul train. Okay, yeah. Can we talk about the soul train? Yeah, let's yeah. talk about soul train. I got what uncomfortable with the soul train. The soul train. I, well, I was like, well, I don't get it. We, we, the train is going to hell, heaven, the eternal damnation, the pearly gates, the great beyond. I'm fine with mm-hmm. not knowing what that means, but yeah. the soul train goes to the great beyond and everyone in the waiting room seems to be almost exclusively African-American and they're all dancing to soul songs. Uh-huh. What are we doing here? I get the joke that they wanted to say Soul Train, but it, honestly, and maybe I, my apologies, it felt kind of weirdly almost racist. Is like, as racist as the Asian man in the dry cleaner shop? Yeah, yes. It, 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 just of, felt, it felt like it's like, oh, we got the old writers from the 60s writing jokes in here. Like we're right. just going to cut out these old belt. It was weird. Of yes. course, the Soul Train's going to have a waka 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 waka. I was like, <laughs> yes, I don't know exactly. if this is worth it. I know you want a dancing scene for the trailer, but this is just weird. Yes. And why are well, Lydia yeah. and Shark Magoo going on the Soul Train? Like, yeah, there was right. a lot of. I know I said Lydia. That's not the right person, but yeah. Well, I think that's the that's the issue with the Soul Train is that it doesn't. Uh, I, I don't think it necessarily lines up with what the um, uh, with at, at all the parallel from the first movie, which had, you know, with the the you know, Deo. Mm-hmm. Um, I actually liked the way they used they incorporated Deo into this movie at the funeral. I thought that, that was, was fun. That was fun. Sure. That was an interesting use. But boy, is you. leaving the cake out in the rain, not the banger. Oh, of it. wow. <laughs> Deo that was like instantly did not iconic. End. This oh, is my not God. a fun song. <laughs> no, it was horrible it was painful i i i I, anytime we had there was just too much like contemporary music although okay fine with the bgs at the beginning as she's reassembling herself but it pulled me out of it again because it's like we're supposed to be otherworldly in a in a fictional land that's slightly askew from ours but we're going to bring in contemporary music or you know current music or okay Mm -hmm. late 20th century music okay that people are familiar with i'm like no i don't want that as much there was something about harry belafonte that is outside of that at least it seems whereas well, it's like almost the like a gibberish song yeah exactly yeah. and yes yeah, but soul music and yeah the bgs and macarthur park and all that just did not fit for me it just felt like somebody had an idea like oh this would be a cool idea and instead of everybody saying well i don't know it was just like yep first thought, like, thought. First thought, best thought, let's go with it. In the movie. It work. I don't know. People will dance. It'll be fine. It'll be, they're dead people. Doesn't matter. Just go for it. It's just go yeah. with confidence and it'll all work out okay. 
Yeah. It's so funny that I'm sitting here thinking about this movie and it's a wackadoo movie and Tim Burton sometimes does wackadoo things. A lot of the time does wackadoo things that I really like because within the wackadoo, there is yeah. consistency. And this movie, I feel oh. like, is wackadoo sans consistency. And that's the problem that I have with it. It's yeah. exhausting because there is there is so little attention to continuity of narrative. Maybe he just, it's been a long time since he's been in this world and he's been directing a lot of weird sort of Disney remakes and dark shadowy things and stuff. Maybe he was, the main thing for him was, I want to go back into this this aesthetic. And then therefore you can see why it's just joke, 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 sort of set piece that doesn't connect to set piece just because he wants to get it all out of his system. I'm not saying that's an excuse. I'm saying maybe that's a cause. Yeah. Well, it is a Alfred Go Miles Millar uh, joint. Uh, okay. And I'm I'm there are some things that they've done that I really like, but they are by and large a this happened and this happened and this happened kind of team. Uh, Seth Graham Smith uh, is uh, mm-hmm. also behind this one. And, um, you know, and nine Lego other Batman uncredited movie. writers. Yeah, yeah, a lot of uncredited yeah. Oh, yeah. writers, of course. Um, so I, I think there are there there are some interesting there is an interesting pedigree, but not an unpredictable one that I would feel this way after this movie. Yeah. Did it look good last as we get to our, our wrap up here in, in terms of the stuff that you see? For the most part, I was psyched by the amount of practical versus CGI stuff yes. that they did. Yeah. That was appreciative. Mm-hmm. I like that. If they had yeah. really gone CGI and really fallen into that just because you can, you should. Right. Moment. It would have just been like, what are we why are we even here? You want to be able to see the seams. You want yeah. people to be wearing costumes, not having fake things. So for that, I was really uh, excited. Yeah, I, I love that it was still the, you know, the skeletons were, you know, prop skeletons that right. were kind of jerky in their movements. Yeah. It wasn't nice fluid CG. It's charming. You know, yeah. it, it worked. It fits. It's consistent. Yes, they maintain that. The, the makeup, everything. And they maintain the consistency of that look from the first film of that reliance on the, the practical. And it, that... If if it had been more CGI, oh yeah, I, that would have been a disaster. They they kept that. I I felt some comfort in that, um, but again, that's just within that land of the dead. When we were in the real world, it it felt too gritty and real. I me. wonder though. And I don't know the answer to this, but I wonder if this movie, just how much CGI is in this movie that is made to play like real obviously they're throwing skeletons that's i I get that but it is now not out of the realm of possibility that all of the stuff that looks like glorious stop motion that they would have done in stop motion in the original movie is just cg stop motion then they just knock down to make it look yeah yeah. right it's probably cheaper yeah, yeah, certainly, that's certainly that's quicker. I'm thinking, yeah, right. Yeah. So I wonder how much. And I, I mean, I just walked out of the movie before we started recording, mm-hmm. so I haven't had a chance to like see if they've released anything. Yeah, uh, but there is, there is some healthy CG in this movie, and I just wonder how much of the stuff that looked practical yeah. we're being conned a little bit huh? just oh, because sure. of the money. Yeah, interesting. Uh, that makes so. me think about the the CGI. Nope, the claymation sequence that Steve brought up. I wonder oh, yeah. if it's just better to fake. I, th- I think that was yeah. LCG. Huh. Yeah, no, it probably was. The the, the uh, now the sandworms did look smoother than because I had just watched mm-hmm. original Beetlejuice two days ago. So that 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 animation was smoother because it was probably stop motion. Whereas now they could do just a it looks oh. you know claymation type of thing. But it, the movement of those sandworms was a lot smoother and all of that. Um, oh, okay. Which I was I was fine with but yeah there's there's certain there was i think there was a certain charm in that the first one just felt like that smaller film of like yeah you know some some love and care into things versus throwing money at at problems i wonder um i I wonder about just if you if you take that same perspective of just shoving things in here and you look Mm -hmm. at the score danny elfman who is a uh you know a musician i adore Mm -hmm. um the score to me felt buffed up too right that Mm -hmm. opening theme as we crawl over the over the Mm -hmm. the city which is with the town which is now not the model um but a tilt shift version of of the town i think (laughs) until we get to the house it went back and forth 
yes. from model oh, to, that's what it to real to model yeah. to real. Okay. And in yeah. the first film, it's a nice setup to a joke, right? Yes. Uh, the house with the, then the spider and he, Adam picks the spider up. And this one, it's to the house and then it's, oh, it's a model. And then, oh, Lydia's in the window. So there's no payoff to the setup of the is it real or is it model? Is it all that? Yeah. Which world are we in? Because I thought, oh, those cows are fake. We're in the model, but now Lydia's in the window. So is this some type of meta statement of we're dealing with layers of reality? Oh, I wish the movie was that smart, but it isn't. But it she's was- not in the window because <laughs> the next cut, she's in a TV studio. Right. Yes, exactly. Oh, God. Um, okay. <laughs> the Anyway, back to the music. I felt like that opening theme song was a sign of the rest of the score of this movie, which was just buffed homage to the old movie Mm -hmm. and jamming, trying to jam in new things. It changes tone. uh, I feel like every second bar and it was it was a mess to listen to. It felt like, oh, that's why I'm watching this movie. It's all chaos, layered chaos on top of chaos. (laughs) I guess we need to rank it. Are you tired of the daily grind? That endless cycle of work and worry? Do you yearn for something more luxurious? Then allow us to introduce you to the achievement. That's right, the achievement. What is it, you ask? It's that feeling deep inside you. The knowledge that you've finally arrived. That you've reached the pinnacle of success. And how do you achieve the achievement? It's quite simple, really. You just hand over your money to us. <laughs> That's it. We'll take it from there. We have highly trained professionals working tirelessly day and night to ensure the achievement is and remains yours. So don't delay. Call now and take the first step toward the achievement. Because of all people in the world, you deserve it. Wait a minute, that's not a thing. You've worked too hard to throw your money at a bunch of yahoos who only give you feelings of emptiness, regret, and the sudden urge for a refund. You're a hero podcast aficionado looking for a tribe. That's why you need to head over to truestory.fm slash join and hook up with the community supporting the next Real Family of Film podcasts. Instead of nothing, you'll actually get bonus episodes and content, early access, a standing invitation to join the live stream chats when we record, ad-free versions of our shows, and access to the super secret channels in our Discord community. Mostly you'll know you're supporting our shows and the team that keeps them coming every week, just as we've been doing since 2011. Thank you for your support. Now back to the show. Letterboxd, everybody. We're on Letterboxd, letterboxd.com slash the next reel. You can see all the movies that we talk about on this, uh, uh, on the, in the next real family of film podcast. Here is where we find the stars. We dig them up from the graves of dead movies past, and we apply them to the letterbox reading for this movie. Steve, what are you going to do? What am I going to do? The, the, yeah. I was at one point, because I saw it this morning, and I was at one point, and I was like, oh, okay, and then my wife and I talked, and it, it changed, and talking with you guys, and it's continuing to just quicksand down to two stars. It just really is not, I, I, Unlike Alien Romulus, where I think we found there were some there were some strong pieces. This one, I there might be moments in there. There's those pieces, but they're they're not a coherent, cohesive part of anything. It's just this this patchy quilt with like, oh, there's a nice looking piece right there, and I can't give it more than two for that, and not a heart. Two stars, no heart. Okay, no heart. No heart. Thomas, no. Heart. That would be your character. There would be a huge hole in your chest if you yes, were in yes. the afterlife. Yes. Your <laughs> character. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm a little bit more charitable than Steve, but just a bit. I mean, Hollywood, it's always the case that Hollywood needs to relook at its playbook, but Hollywood really needs to look at its playbook. Uh, I feel like one of the things that is maybe causing this bloat to all of these movies, I wonder, maybe it's been there forever and I'm just being um, naive, but like Marvel movies. Mm-hmm. At one point, we're all almost an act too long. 
that they yeah. seem to think that like there are studios executives being like, they're not going to be excited unless you have this other thing. And it's just not true. <laughs> mm -hmm. More you, people, I mean, more and more we talk about, and then I was ready for the movie to be over and it kept going. Mm -hmm. I just wish there's something so cool. There's one film genre that has learned that and it continues to evolve in that way of keeping things as tight and sleek as possible. And that's the horror genre. And the horror genre is the one genre that always makes money because it doesn't take a lot of money to do that stuff. I just wish these kind of filmmakers would look at this and be like, let's try to remake the feeling of the first one and not feel like we have to make it into four different movies. That being yeah. said, I give it five stars and a heart. What a weird toy. <laughs> um, no, I give it two and a half stars. I maybe would give it three because there is a lot of physical visual beauty to the movie. Uh, no, I'm going to go three because, and some of the acting is Ooh. fun, but I will say, unfortunately, no heart because I just don't feel this film has enough there, there for all yeah. of its excitement. Okay. I think my problem is that I have a lot of movies that are in that three star range that I genuinely like. I really genuinely like those movies in that three star range. It's kind of right in the middle ground. They're great popcorn movies. And I really kind of just was waiting for this one to end. So I don't think I can go as high as three stars, but there are enough beats of like genuine laughs, particularly from uh, O'Hara. And I like, um, you know, Jenna Ortega so much. I think her storyline was so um, uh, filled with opportunity, never executed that I think I could actually go two stars and and maybe yeah, it's it's like two stars and a heart or three stars and no heart. Ugh. That's a tough one. Yeah. That's a so, tough one. Sophie's choice. It really it it is. Some a child has to die for me to make this, this choice. <laughs> yeah, I might be taking this a little seriously. Maybe maybe a little <laughs> too far. Isn't that what her choice was about? I haven't seen the movie, but I assume she had to pick right. between this or that, like like what, what snack to bring on the train. Okay. That's what it was. Which child will be fed ultimately? Yeah. Yes. No, not that. You should probably watch the I movie. I should probably watch it before I keep bringing it up all the time. Okay. No, one kid's got a dairy allergy, one's got a gluten allergy, and it's like, which, which snack do I bring on? Like, which, yeah. which child do I feed? Train. <laughs> uh, I think I'm going to go with two stars. I don't even think I'm going to give it a heart. I think two stars is going to be where I land. And I am actually going down an entire point since thinking about it. I'm going all the way from three to two, partly because of what you guys said, but also because I was reminded when you brought up beat, there's a lot of three ones that I, that I kind of like and stuff. I have no interest in seeing this movie again. Yeah. And that's incredibly yeah. telling. I almost want to see every movie again at some point, And I was thinking about wanting to see this. If you guys would have been big fans of this, I a hundred percent because of all those caveats. Yeah. Too hot, too tired. I would have been oh, like, sure. okay, new, new Tommy needs to bring new eyes on it. But I, it feels I'm clearly wasn't alone. in the fact that I have no interest in revisiting it Two, and two Tommy, stars. I, you said this ahead. felt long. I just checked. It's only an hour and 44 minutes. That's also telling the original Beetlejuice is an hour. That it, it, you're right. It does feel long, but it's only an hour and forty four minutes long. So I would have thought it, it was it, over two hours. It, yeah, because absolutely. that's what it, throwing a bunch of numbing storylines that don't give you an arc. Let yes. you. You're just watching. I thought, I thought, oh, is this a long run on sentence? Yeah. Right. I thought. Oh, is it one of these that crept over two hours because of that's the trend? But I'm like, oh no, they kept it down to a hour forty four, but it felt at least half an hour longer than that. So, whereas the original hmm. Beetlejuice is like an hour and a half, this is like 15 minutes longer, but it feels yeah. it's twice as long. That's really interesting. Yeah. Two stars all around, average of two. That makes Oof. the math easy. And uh, we uh, that's it. So what are we going to do next month? Mm -hmm. um, tell us what we're going to do next month. Yes, we are going to see, do you like huge rats? Do you like vigilante crime? Do you like weird people with clown suits anyways we are seeing joker the madness of crowds jolly a do right isn't that called Folly the madness a deux. Folly Folly a deux. isn't that the madness of crowds isn't that what that means uh I or madness of two party party number two yeah oh okay so we're seeing party of two joker joker party of two uh next month which i'm very excited i'm an enormous fan of the first movie uh, and the fact that they're adding a musical element to this one makes me 
very excited. I love the trailer. I do think the trailer shows maybe a little bit too much if you connect certain scenes to other things, but I am mm. excited for it. So folio de literally means from the French double madness. Okay, so uh -huh. I was close. All right. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I said the yeah. word madness. I said you madness. Did. You crowd. really did. No, yeah. you can't. you're great. You earned that point back. Okay, good. Right. I give myself a heart. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you, everybody, for joining us, hanging out with us today for this conversation. I want to. I'll just say one more thing before we started this. I watched a uh, a review of some people who are younger than us by a whole generation or maybe more who were giving a review of this movie and had the exact same feeling about the villains, that there were too many villains, but my God, they love this movie. They love everything Beetlejuicey about it. They love the original Beetlejuice. They want more Beetlejuice. They can't wait for Beetlejuice 3. It'll, it, it'll work itself out. So I wonder if this movie is going to really, is, is going to do well ultimately because yes. we're not the target audience anymore 100 percent. i was with a i was at a a training today with about 50 people and all the people that had seen beetlejuice loved it beetlejuice yep. beetlejuice loved it so yeah it's beetlejuice colon not for us no <laughs> yeah. it's not. there were people laughing at jokes that i thought that was such an obvious thing that i saw coming i can't laugh at it because i'm like well duh that's what the joke is gonna be it just and they were chuckling at things i just thought and you turned around I, and said that in the theater? Yeah, and I'm like, what's wrong with you? This is <laughs> oh, better than this. You've been poisoned. I wondered if Tommy, like you, like, did I, am I not in the right headspace for this right. movie? Why are people yeah. chuckling? And then my wife's there next to me and we're both just stoic. Like, yeah, this is not good. Not funny. Oh, well. So we are continuing that film board trend of just nailing the popular picks for us. <laughs> nailing it. Uh, thanks, everybody, for hanging out. We will see you next time for Joker Double Madness. Meeting adjourned.